name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At the end of the film Elizabeth, this is Elizabeth I, is in conversation with Sir Francis Walsingham. He tells her that all men need something greater than themselves to look up to and worship. They must be able to touch the divine here on earth. Elizabeth then gazes at a statue of the Virgin Mary and says, she holds such power over men's hearts. They died for her. To which Sir Francis replies, they have found nothing to replace her. We are left asking ourselves, who is this woman beyond compare? This arresting scene places before our imaginations the depth of regard and devotion with which Mary, mother of God, was held by the English following the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. Let us also hold in our minds that England, by that time, was known as Mary's Dowry. This title first appeared in the middle of the 11th century, and shortly after, in 1061, Our Lady appeared to Richeldis de Faverche, the Lady of the Manor in Walsingham. Rochelles had a deep and profound love for Mary. And Our Lady asked Rochelles to build a replica of the Holy House from Nazareth, where she lived with her parents, Saints Joachim and Anne, so that we would be able to share in her joy, which she experienced when the Archangel Gabriel visited her and asked her to be the mother of God. Our Lady desires to share with us the joy of the Annunciation. She wishes to share with us that pivotal point in the entire history of the universe, the moment of the Incarnation. When we are reflecting on who this beautiful and remarkable woman is, it can assist us greatly to inquire about her parents, about her childhood, about her theological role in relation to Eve. But for the time being, let us continue to focus on her relationship with the people of England. At the end of the 14th century, England as the Diary of Mary was written about by the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Arundel, and he wrote, We English, being her own diary, as we are commonly called, ought to surpass others in the fervour of our praises and devotions. At the same time, in art, the Wilton Diptych was created which portrays Richard II, the monarch of the time, giving the country of England to Mary. Another instance of this is an altarpiece bearing the inscription, This is thy diary, O Holy Virgin. Again, with Richard II giving England to her. These works of art and the comments by the Archbishop of Canterbury were partly inspired by the first dedication made by King Richard II in Westminster Abbey in 1381, as he sought the protection of Our Lady in the face of great political turmoil. So England 
at this dedication was set aside. She was a gift, a dowry, for Our Lady, under her guidance and her protection. This sense of national identity, deeply bonded to the Blessed Mother of God, reflects that she was seen as an indispensable part of life in England. She was the great mother of our nation, leading us, wanting to share with us the limitless light and joy which is at the heart of friendship with God through her Son, Jesus the Lord. In guiding the English to Jesus, she was truly the protectoress of the English of England. Our Lady is the greatest of all the saints, the most perfect human person to have ever graced this universe. She is forever blessed and enjoys the deepest of relationships, of friendships with the eternal, holy, and indivisible Trinity. Yet, wherever Our Lady appears, she is intimately tied to the people of that place, of that time. Her apparitions are both timely in history and yet reflect something of the eternal, of the unchanging word of God. So when we speak of England as Mary's diary, we are referring to a title, to a name given to the people of this fair country, which has never been revoked or canceled by us, or indeed by our Blessed Lady. Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when his mother bestows a blessing, she does so as the mother of God, the saint most closely configured to the saving grace of God. Mary continues to shower down love upon the people of England, her diary, inspiring them with devotion to her, that she might continue to be a beacon for us, a path of illumination with which to approach her son. For England, the joy of the Annunciation through her apparition at Walsingham is at the heart of our relationship with her. Henry VIII had many medieval statues of Our Lady destroyed. The statue of Our Lady of Walsingham was taken in 1538 to Chelsea, down the road from here, and burned. Even though man might destroy a visible statue of the greatest saint, the goodness and holiness of her intentions never wane, they never change. This year, 2020, is a great Marian year for England. On March the 29th, England will be rededicated to Our Lady. This moment has been in preparation since 2018, and the statue of Our Lady of Walsingham will have visited every cathedral in England before finally arriving at Westminster on the 19th of March until the 21st, the week before the rededication itself. At that moment, each of us is invited to make a personal promise, a deeper response to sharing in her joy, 
but there is also the community sense of rededication, a sense of national identity in service and honour of the great Mother of God. How is Our Lady calling her diary to respond to her Son? How does she want us to serve together in bringing the saving love of God to all? Let us now endeavour to explore this question by understanding something of who she was through her earthly life, through the scriptures, through the living tradition of the Church, through the graces and gifts granted to the mystics over the centuries, and also by her apparitions. In St. Luke's Gospel, at the Annunciation, before Mary has given her consent, even before Gabriel has asked the question, which will change the course of history, Gabriel addresses her as hail or rejoice, full of grace. This is the only biblical example where an angel addresses someone by a title rather than a name. But of course this is entirely fitting when considering that a Lord in 1858, also on the 25th of March, the Solemnity of the Annunciation, Mary declared that she was the Immaculate Conception, again a title not a name. The angel Gabriel, in addressing her as full of grace, is consistent with Mary being immaculate. Full of grace, immaculate, are so deeply connected. This is before she has made her fiat, her yes, to the perfect will of God. Dearest Mary is immaculate from her conception. She is the immaculate conception. The early fathers of the church saw Mary as the new Eve. Both were conceived without sin. The father's insights were rooted in scripture and lived experience. If we look at the readings of Justin Martyr, Tertullian, St. Irenaeus, these church fathers saw in Genesis 3.15 that the head of the serpent will be crushed by Mary. What Eve broke through her disobedience will be restored through Mary's obedience. In the view of others and St. John Henry Newman, the lineage of St. Irenaeus can be traced back to the beloved disciple, apostle and evangelist, St. John, by way of St. Polycarp, the martyr bishop who was ordained by St. John. Not far from Ephesus, where St. John is buried, a stone house was discovered through the visions of blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, in which the Blessed Virgin Mary passed the remainder of her life before her Assumption with St. John. These two people were called together under the cross of their Redeemer, and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. To follow in her steps, to reflect on her friendships, her relationships, we begin to paint a picture of this unique woman. Further scriptural exegesis reveals how Mary was indeed foretold, prophesied, as the daughter of Zion. In the Hebrew, daughter of Zion means the ripest fruit of the people of Israel and the most chosen portion of the ancient synagogue. In Zephaniah, we read, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, 
Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. This oracle is prophesying the restoration of the nations, the power of the Lord to bring forgiveness and healing with joyful Mary as the singular vessel of devotion, the Ark of the Covenant, the gate of heaven, the means by which humanity receives their salvation, their Lord. So all three readings reveal a woman who is especially graced, one for whom the universe had been yearning. We can also learn about Mary from the church's tradition and early writings, which have bequeathed to us a picture of her parents and indeed Mary's youth. One of the earliest documents about Mary is known as the Protevangelium of James. There are other writings which are revealed to us by saints and mystics, St. Bridget of Sweden, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, Venerable Mary of Agreda, and the venerated Elizabeth of Schonau. From these documents, we learn that Saints Joachim and Anne had not been blessed with children up to that point. And even though they were judged harshly by their contemporaries as not to have children was viewed as a sign of God's displeasure, they never spoke ill of the Lord like Job, but beseeched his forgiveness and mercy. One day, when praying for a child, Anne also prayed humbly for the family who would, in the fullness of time, give birth to the mother of the Messiah. The Archangel Gabriel then appeared to Anne and told her how their waiting had been to prepare them for the great gift that was to be bestowed to her and Joachim. Their future daughter was to be called Mary, and she will be the mother of the Redeemer. This sense of such a gift, of such condescension of the Most High to visit them, instilled in them such charity, such humility, Mary was to be totally dedicated to the Lord from the very moment of her conception. In her own life, we learn of a woman whose humility is exquisite. She truly lived to love and serve the Lord in obedience. In speaking to St. Bridget of Sweden of her youth, she said, I vowed in my heart to observe virginity if it was pleasing to him and to possess nothing in the world, but if God willed otherwise, that his will, not mine, be done. I committed my will absolutely to him. We have touched upon the greatness of Mary for humanity and the purity of Mary. But this purity and beauty never ever shied away from the sufferings of her beloved son. Let us return to Saint Bridget. At the time of the crucifixion, Mary shared with Bridget that, and I thanked him for everything. A certain joy, a certain joy was even mingled with my grief, for I perceived how he, who had never sinned, had willed to suffer so much for sinners out of his great love. 
Mary desires to identify with Jesus, her son, at every level of her life. And therefore, by extension, she chooses to identify with each of us. She wants to share his sufferings so as to assist him in saving us. And she is joyful in her suffering. If we return to the scriptures again and to St. Luke, we recall the prophecy of Simeon, who foresaw that a sword would pierce through her own soul too. Part of her extraordinary beauty lies in her response to the gifts given to her. She sees herself as a beloved servant, as a handmaid sent to lead all to Jesus. Everything she is, is because of Jesus, through Jesus and for Jesus. This is her joy and she wants it to be ours. At the beginning of this homily on the person of dearest Mary, I quoted from the film Elizabeth, where it implies that Elizabeth I sought to become a kind of substitute for the blessed ever virgin for the English subjects. There is only one mother of God. By reflecting on her divine calling, her supernatural gifts, her charity, we behold a woman of such radiant beauty that no other human can or could ever take her place. She is the dearest way to Jesus. As England is rededicated to Our Lady as her diary this March, may we embrace her son's cross in all we do and say, trusting in Mary as our mother in Christ. Mary will take us to his cross. She will teach us how to adore his divine will in all things and to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in joy, the joy of the Annunciation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.